Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming. We've got a fantastic panel here, and we'll try to get through as much as we can uh, so that it's inf informative for everyone. Um, so let's just start with a quick, easy one. Um, in a word, what's the vibe in VC land? You know, we've come through a, a VC winter. I was talking to Barry earlier, and he says, you know, VCs are uh, optimists by trade. But in a word, how's the vibe? What's the vibe at the moment out there? In a word. In a word. Tight. Uh, cautious. Ooh. You stole my word. I would say cautious as well. Hot. Cautious. Oh, also. cautious, cautious. Optimistic. There we go. There <laughs> we go. We've, we've finally got a good one. Um, so with that in mind, um, what would you say the key factors are that VCs look for um, and, and consider when they're looking for a, a young tech startup in today's current market? Well, I mean, the, the formula that we use in Techstars is six criteria. The first three are easy to remember. Team, team, team. Okay, we invest pre-seed, investing right now one and a half million a year in 12 startups in Web3, it's what I do. But team, 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 market, traction, product, or idea, right? So above all else, when you're investing at the earliest stages, at pre-seed level, it's about the people. And it's about not just the one individual founder, but the co-founders together. Do they like each other? Have they talked about marriage yet? Right, because when co-founders get together, they're getting married because they need to be together for the long term. And beyond that, the initial team dynamics, what market are they selling into? What product are they trying to sell to that market? Do they have deep first-hand experience in the problem they're solving? Well, how much progress have they made? Right, is it you know, uh, user lists they've been building up, waiting lists, or do they have real revenue? And then finally, your idea, your product. Uh, is it something that is can be built? Is it something scale that's scalable? Uh, and you know, that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg, but those are the, the key criteria for me. Alan? You know, just, just to talk about the point you made earlier about you know, how our VCs feeling in general. Unfortunately, most VCs operate like a bit of a herd mentality. They all kind of go rushing after the next hot thing. Um, but I think everyone has a kind of flavor or a framework that they use. And what I would say is like the size of market, the big market opportunity, how big is the opportunity? You know, wh where is the where is the market share? Where is the opportunity and how big is it and what value can be created? And I'd say, you know, a team is absolutely hugely important to me. As, as I take your point, I think team is everything because teams, good teams can pivot when they need to pivot. They can rise to the challenge, they can change their value prop to meet, you know, any, any kind of turmoil that they come across in the journey. So I think team is absolutely vital. But I, I use that term value proposition because I think that, that kind of is all encompassing, whether you're a seed, whether you're a series A, whether you're a series B, whether you're a later stage, if you can't articulate, articulately explain your value proposition uh, and you don't have something that's compelling for customers, well, you're never going to be successful. So getting that right at seed and evolving it through your journey is absolutely vital. So that's something I really kind of dig into as a value prop. Yeah, I mean, I think what I would say, I mean, I, I agree with the guys and, um, you know, you're looking for a really compelling problem that matters to a huge amount of people, you know, so the market has to be huge actually for VC investors to be interested. It's just the model of VC, you know, that's what we require. The team piece is always important. Um, I think in the last 12 months, there's been a bigger focus on capital efficiency. Um, and there's a lot of talk about that. I heard the term pre precision finance used recently. Um, so you need to be making sure that your, your plan is allocating capital to the key things that the business needs to do um, in order to hit that value inflection. Um, I would also say as well that you know, not all venture investors are the same. You know, and for example, I work for Atlantic Bridge, we're a deep tech investor, so, so we want to see intellectual property, we want to see companies that are really differentiated from a, from a tech perspective. Um, but that's going to be different for different investors. So understanding um, the, the mandate and the, the preferences of individual investors is really important also. Right, all right. Great, and I think the guys covered a lot of the main stuff. I guess at a very basic level, don't be an arsehole, it kind of helps. Um, do what you say you're going to do, deliver what you say you're going to deliver. Um, you have to dream big, have ambition, be sensible. And uh, in your interactions with the investor and everyone that you, you, you interact with, be professional, be timely. Kind of old-fashioned stuff, actually, which is a subset of what Pete has said, so I'm more old-fashioned than Pete, so that's fine. <laughs> right. Now, I think I know what a lot of the answer is going to be for this one, but if anyone can not say AI, that'd be great, but are there any specific trends or sectors uh, that you're particularly interested in at the moment or that you feel are particularly hot? 
Uh, let's start from the, from the back, Barry, you go first. Without saying AI. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So look, AI, and um, <laughs> yeah, that clearly is a trend. I think in Ireland, there's some stuff going on. I'm not sure quite the degree of activity yet. It's still coming through. I think, again, really with an Irish lens on what, what seems to be strong here is the cyber area seems to be particularly strong. Um, there's a lot of great companies coming through that at least we're seeing it from an outstone perspective as well. Um, yeah, and look, it, again, it's old fashioned. People really trying to solve real problems and, you know, and, and really thinking that, thinking that through. And going back, I'm not sure, I'm actually finding it difficult to hear all of the answers up here, believe it or not. But you know, we talked earlier about the earlier question, you know, people really tackling big problems, big markets. And I think one of the challenges in an Irish context um, is uh, you know, we're thinking on the island of Ireland, and if you're really trying to attract capital from outside of Ireland, it just doesn't, it just doesn't cut it. it just, it's not enough. So if you're a consumer business and you're building a big brand in Ireland, it's really hard to attract venture capital um, to go to the UK or to go to even northern, from the south to the north of Ireland. I think really thinking through painting a big picture, a big opportunity uh, makes sense. So I'll answer every question in arrears into the next question then. <laughs> <laughs> Any current trends or areas of interest? Yeah, that, maybe actually to answer it a different way. You know, I, I think I would say climate sustainability impact okay. yeah. and application of technologies in that space. Um, you know, climate has kind of been a hot topic, I'd say, for a number of years, and it's just getting louder, and I think it's evolving as well. Um, and when I talk about impact, I'd say that covers everything from climate sustainability, but also health technologies, also um, tech that can support diversity and inclusion um, criteria. You know, as venture investors, we, we get our money from someone, you know, and those, those limited partners, those big institutions, um, this is high on their agenda now. You know, it's a, it's a really important item, and as a result, it's really important for us in terms of how we deploy capital. Yeah. Alan? Yeah, actually, our funds are also impact funds, but I think, you know, fundamentally, it's about what's the purpose-driven kind of mission, if you like, of, of the entrepreneur. And, we, I, I like companies that focus on big, big opportunities, but also where there are big problems. And a lot of the boring sectors, if you like, like healthcare and education, the kind of legacy sectors, are going through huge transformations right now. And how can you let you know, technology kind of just, you know, effectively disintermediate that value chain to make it more successful, you know, make it kind of more scalable on a global basis? And I think if you take those big sectors, and I, I'd include energy and climate in, in, in that category as well, you're not limited to your backyard. There's huge applicability of those solutions around the world. And if you can prove it out in a small market like Ireland, you can take it to the US, you can take it to Asia, huge opportunities in Asia, huge opportunities in the Middle East. So I'd say it's taking products and services that are solving those big world problems um, in areas like health, education, and climate, and then taking them you know, abroad and international. Yeah, the question now. So a question from the audience is, uh, is it better to back a tech company that is dominating a niche or a generalist tech business chasing multiple verticals? Let's start, let's start with you there if you want. Well, I, I mean, to, to me it all comes back down to the founders, right? Do they have deep first-hand experience in the problem they're solving? And if that is a niche that they're chasing because they have deep first-hand experience in that niche, then wonderful, it's great if they have more of kind of a combination of uh, a technology moat along with an ability to sell, ability to build relationships across the board, well, you know, if they don't have that specific niche, but you see more of a dynamic mix of founder experience there, then if they're going after multiple markets, that's fine. The key is to do it in order, right? And that we talk a lot to founders about your market kind of being one of those, and I'm dating myself here, but I see at least enough in the audience here to to know that when I say this, you'll know what I mean, but they remember the board game Trivial Pursuit, right? And those game pieces with the little wedges that, goes, that go in. Your first market that you're selling to is that first wedge, that first thing that you get when you answer that first big question. And then as you build out markets around that, you're getting new wedges of that market. The thing is, is to do that adjacently and to solve a problem that is close to the problem you're originally solving for a customer group or a demographic that is close to the demographic that you solve your initial problem for. So to me, again, it's, you know, it's less about are you going after a niche or are you going after a broader 
market, it's what do you have the ability to actually hit. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this is hopefully going to be an interesting one for the audience. What are some common pitfalls or mistakes that you've seen when you know, startups are approaching venture capital firms? Alan? Yeah, well, I think there's a whole bunch of mistakes, I'd say. Uh, you know, peppering in terms like AI when there's actually no AI, or peppering in terms like impact when there's no impact really kind of irritates me a little bit. So I would say, you know, just throwing things into slide decks for the sake of it, but actually no substance is really your problem for me. Um, but I think in terms of the fundamental thing, I'd say, is that a lot of entrepreneurs don't do their own diligence on the investor they're coming to talk to, you know? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a bit of spray and pray. It's like, here you go. Here, here's a slide deck, uh, what do you think? Can we come and get you know, 10 million off you? Yeah. Uh, which is a little bit you know, <laughs> kind of irritating as well. So I'd say doing your diligence on, you know, is this investor right for you? Can they add value? Do they invest in your stage, in your sector? There's a bit of responsibility on the entrepreneur to actually do their diligence. Uh, can I work with that crew? Are they actually acceptable? Are they, do they have any expertise that they can bring to my business or not? Um, and I'd say just in the process of actually, you know, the materials, like some companies, uh, I would say present really, really well, and they have the full stack of what they need behind them for the follow-on stages. So they have, they got a plan, they got their model, they got their tech demos, whatever, everything ready. Uh, some don't, and some really come in with very basic, thrown together materials, expecting to land a five million euro check, and they haven't put the work in. You know, and it's at the end of the day, this you know, this isn't free money. Venture capital isn't free money. We're about backing winners. We want winners who are going to be number one or number two in their sector. That's what we want. And if it's, if it's a niche and they can command the niche and be the, the best monopoly in that niche, that's what we want. And that's what every VC wants. So if you have a level of ambition, it's like anything. If you're an, a, a sports person, you have to practice, practice, practice. It's all about your preparation. It's all about, you know, it's all about the training before you actually reach the pitch. So I would say you know, it's about practice and it's about the alignment. Yeah. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah. And, and one thing I would say, actually, you know, it's important to understand that working with a venture investor is a collaborative process, right? So it's not like you're gonna pitch a plan and that's the exact plan that they're gonna invest in. They will have opinions. They won't all be correct, but you need to have a collaborative approach and, and understand that what you're doing is you're getting into a, a kind of a long-term relationship, you know, five, five, 10, 15 year relationship with people who will want to contribute to the strategy and the direction of your business and what you're doing. So that's what, um, that, that's, the, the, um, that's the game that you're, you're entering into. Um, and, and on that as well, when, when you're coming in for a first pitch, if you've got 45 minutes, don't have a 44 minute pitch deck, right? You know, give that opportunity for discussion because you're not really getting anything out of the meeting um, if you don't allow that time. So I think that's allowing that space for collaboration in your thinking, but also with regard to how you manage the time mm. is really important. That's valuable advice, Barry. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I guess being a founder is about making mistakes because mm. that's how you find the next opportunity, you know, they will not, it will never be straight. That's the one thing that's clear. So don't get set back, don't be set back by mistakes at any of these stages. I think mistakes in fundraising, that's an interesting one, leave space for questions, don't do 20 minute introductions, you know, get, get, and re really, I, I think the investment decision can often because investors of smaller brains than founders be made really very, very quickly in the first few minutes. So really prepare for a, a strong impact statement, uh, really explain the problem that you're solving and, and why it's a, a, a huge opportunity. A kind of a, a mistake that I see, which is, which, which is a very basic one, but I, is really understanding the business model of the business that you're building. And the, the economics of ultimately, as Alan said, we're looking to invest in big businesses that usually compound in some element in terms of how they grow over time. And a simple question is, what's your key, what is your key metric? What, what metric are you, what are you solving for next week, next month, in a year? And what metric are you solving for to convince the next investor to actually come in, invest in your business? Because that speaks to knowing what you need to do now, but also what your ambition around the, 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 the next investor. But it's a, it's, a real, as I say, most business models can be six cells in an Excel spreadsheet, give or take. And if you're a, if you're a software business and you have a customer acquisition cost, you have a churn, you have a lifetime value, you have how much you're charging, and then it's, you're, you spin the wheel and that's a software business. And, and if you're a consumer business, it's a different wheel. If you're, you're goal-seeking users, it's a, again, it's different. But really understand that and the fact that capital 
from an investor is being given for you to, to power that up. If you can't explain how the addition of capital into your business doesn't move your business dramatically along, well then you might need that capital, which is, by the way, is totally fine. Venture investment is definitely not for everybody. I say it all the time. It's not, it's not an end in itself. Most businesses don't get venture capital. So, but I think understanding what we, we want and what we need is important. But at a basic level, um, you are a burning platform generally when you're a startup. Yep. You're on fire and money is the cash to put out the fire. And if you don't have enough money, you vaporize. That's, that's effectively a version of what this journey is. It's yep. not nice, but that's what... And I say to people, you're going to sack your friends, you're going to fall out with your founder, you're going to go home to your partner, and you're going to be stressed more than anything you've ever been stressed about. That's the reality. It's not the jazz. So I'm not putting people off, but we, we test for that. When we're speaking to people, if you're coming in and you're... You really do. Huh? You do. I, like, it's, it's not a game. It's yeah. not a game. If you come in and you think it's a game, you'll get found out. And People ask us why, you, you know, why we don't get money, and sometimes we see people and it's a game. It's not it's very serious, and we're on your side, by the way. Well, Emer said, like, it, it can't be a, a, an adversary. It's not meant to be an adversarial relationship, but good friends say tough things to good friends, right? You're try, you know, so it's this balance in there, but uh, it kind of goes back to trying to you know, really understand what you're trying to build, take it seriously. Yep. And, and we will, you know, that's what we're testing for. And that's the coffees, that's, that's when you go out and you have beers with your, you know, don't get extremely drunk with your, <laughs> before the money's come in, yeah. you know, <laughs> before the talks are so Valuable advice. It's bad business, Good. it's bad business, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah I would just, just, just to build on what, what the folks are saying, I mean, I'm assuming out in the crowd, we've got some people working in sales or business development, relationship management, show of hands. Anyone ever built a customer pipeline? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Built a funnel? Okay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> For startup founders out there, it's the same thing. When you're building a customer pipeline, a sales pipeline, you're researching the hell out of the market. You're looking at who is your ideal customer? Who is it that you want to have as a customer? Anybody gets parked outside of that, you don't try to go pitch to them. You're not going to go after them as your customer. So why do you go after investors that will not invest in your business? Right? You've got to look at the stage that the investors typically invest at, the theme, the size of the fund that they're investing out of, the size of the investment that you need. You've got to find all that to match up. Yeah. One other thing that you need to get used to, the word no. Right? Any founders in the room? Any startup founders in the room? Yeah? <laughs> A couple? Okay. Can I just get everybody to say the word no? <laughs> Louder. No. This is getting a bit Tony no. Robbins now. Come on. Pete. Exactly. No, I'm good like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But listen, that's the thing you got to get used to is because, as Barry said, 98 out of 100 times, VCs are going to say no. You got to get used to that no and get to the no and learn to love the no because you're going to get lessons out of that no. And you're going to get information. You're going to get perhaps other introductions out of that. And the quicker you can get to that by either not even pitching to that investor to begin with because they won't invest in you, or once you do, feel it coming, get to that, uh, and you know, take your lessons learned and move on to the next investor and don't get bogged down with the fact that they said no. And, and just to build on that piece about doing your diligence on investors, it's also really important to try and have a sense of where they're at in their fund. You know, are they actively deploying capital? Because it's, it's easier to have these conversations early on in the fund than later on, depending on you know, your, your timeline to exit sometimes. Um, and also, you should know their portfolio. So you should know if they've invested in similar companies. Um, you should try and like, look at their network, see if there's a way that you can get introductions um, or you know, people to kind of um, speak on your behalf um, behind the scenes. So doing all of that work is important because if you're pitching a business and someone's had a really bad experience in that market or with that kind of business before, then it's an uphill struggle as well. Um, conversely, you know, if, if someone's had a, really, a big success in the area, then you need to be aware that they're going to know the tech really well, they know the market really well, and they'll be enthusiastic about it. Yeah. What I will say is I'm actually a poacher turned gamekeeper. So I have an entrepreneur who's raised capital and now I'm allocating capital. So I feel that's kind of constant inner tension. Uh, but what I will say is when I was fundraising as an entrepreneur, 
my, my view on VCs was, well, they all think that they're the smartest guy or girl in the room, that they know everything. Uh, and there is a bit of a VC mentality, I have to say, that you know, it's kind of like we're God's gift to everything. So there is a, a job, there's an educational job for the entrepreneur to do, to say, look, this is why I'm convinced this is the right product or service. This is why I'm convinced this is the proposition. And you, Mr. or Mrs. VC, you need to understand why. And here's all the telemetry, here's all the data, and build your case, almost like you're, you're, you're kind of building a lawyer case. And just on the no piece, one of my partners, he's not here, he's actually in London today, Kieran. Uh, Kieran is a, he's the best fundraiser I've ever met, and he's a great expression. A no is a delayed yes. They just need to be educated. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you touched on the importance of a, of a network and connections. Just how important is a strong network? Because we, myself and Barry were talking about it earlier. Um, how important is a strong network and what, and what steps can entrepreneurs take to build and leverage their network effectively? Yeah, I, I might, yeah, in terms of, I guess we talked a little bit about it. Firstly, the Irish market is a small market and it is a, that's a good thing from my, from my perspective. If you speak to London VCs, they almost can't take a cold call. That's, it's a funnel thousands of startups coming in. We get a lot of startups coming in. Frankly, they, you might want to talk to me, but we want to, Elks don't want to talk to you, right? So from a, from a we, we've done deals totally out of the blue. So it's, it's a zero problem for us, for people to email or to connect to any of the team. A lot of us are here, um, but it, it helps to be, to be known in the market. It helps to, it helps to network ar 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 around uh, being on too many panels, ironically, can be a danger zone as well. Like if you're, you know, if you're winning too many startup awards, it's not always the best thing in the universe, right? That's because um, um, you could be spending too much time out there in the market. But I think being present in, in the investor community, I would actually say the most powerful network to build is what Pete talked about: is your customer network actually, and seeding that as early as possible and getting insights on that network. Um, at least in an Irish context. I think in other cases, a warm introduction from a VC or a founder, it definitely helps. So we will take that seriously. But a lot of founders are terrible investors as well, right? So, it, so we sometimes get things and we go, I can't believe you thought that's good. That's not a bad thing. We want to get, we want to get, but we want, we want to get the next one because no one really knows where the, the real nuggets are in terms of the real opportunities. So we want to speak to people early, and we'll say it's a bit early for us, or the model isn't isn't right. So um, maybe answering a slightly different question about early engagement. There's never really a, a non-pitch pitch. So if you're if you're early, still be ready, as if you're properly ready. So if you're if you really don't feel confident, the way, way you said, Alan, is interesting, like, I believe, I believe, I believe. Even if you're wrong, if it's backed up and you really believe it, um, and we, we can challenge, but if you're not confident on something, I think either be open about that, saying this is the variable we're looking at, um, but, you know, your first contact does matter. So if you are networking, just be be prepared. I'm a scout, so it's be a look, is it in Irish? Be, yeah, yeah. be, prepared. be prepared. You know, so the idea of an elevator pitch, again, is something that, it, 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 you know, it shouldn't be like a computer program. And Irish people were not as comfortable as Americans, and you're in the state, like, and, and we've got Pete here. Everything Pete says to me is true, basically, <laughs> because he's saying with an American eye. I'm there going, this is outstanding, it must be true. Yeah, true. Because Americans are trained to, you know, you're trained in the, in that sort of language, whereas I think we in our, our I tell Irish people to be American, because yeah. I know they won't, they'll just be somewhere in between, but you have to be confident, and, and so the networking is important, don't overdo it, but um, it helps, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and you know, Dunnick has spoken on the last panel about the incredible supports that are available yeah. in the Irish ecosystem, and it's true, it's a great place to start a business, you know. Um, and it's a very welcoming place as well. So people are really generous with their time, actually, even if they won't invest in you or they don't want, you know, you can't participate in their accelerator program, they'll always give you your time. One other thing I would say to be mindful of is that it's a small network and all of the investors know each other as well, you know, and they know all the accelerator managers and they know the technology transfer officers and they know Enterprise Ireland. So you have to be consistently professional across the board, yeah. um, you know, because every interaction you have actually could have an influence on um, a, a potential investment from one investor. Yeah. 
I think yeah, net network is just vital. It's like an ecosystem to support your, your, your journey, your entrepreneurial journey, and you need a really good network. And, and you know, at VentureWave, we, we get a, a lot of inbound, a lot of inbound stuff. And you know, all VCs are pretty lazy, I'd say. And if something comes in through a positive referral from someone you rate, you're going to look at it. You know, you're going to look at things that come in through your network that are rated by someone you rate in your network. So if you have a good network and you've got good, good kind of actors in your network that support you and they're going to link you into Barry or Emer or myself, or any, you know, that's actually a really positive thing. You know, we may not invest, to, to Barry's point, but the fact you've got that positive referral is a huge, huge asset. Similarly on the sales side, like, you know, I, I would class myself, you know, if people ask me, like, what am I? I I'd say I'm a networker, or I used to be pretty active as a networker, now maybe less active, more, should be more active. Um, but it's all about, you know, you, every interaction you have, uh, if you build and you invest in that relationship, it will pay off, maybe not right now, this, this yeah. moment in time, but years down the line. And my own career is a, is a testament to that, that the people I met 10 years ago, 15 years ago, who were investing with me and alongside me now, uh, and I might have met them at a conference like this. So my sense is, you know, network is absolutely everything. And you, a business can't survive without a good networker in the C-suite. Yeah. Totally, totally. And, you know, when I talked about building your investor pipeline, right, the same way you build your customer pipeline, when you go to do that, you're looking probably at 100 investors that you want to have in your list, of those that you think would be interested in your business. If you're an Irish business and thinking about that, you're not going to find 100 investors in Ireland. Okay, you may get 20, 25 VCs and you know, a you know, number of angels in there as well. And so what you're going to do is that you say, well, let's narrow this down. And for the sector I invest in, in Web3, it's not 20 or 25. There's three investors in Ireland. Yeah. There's Techstars, there's Cosimo Ventures, and there's Sure Valley Ventures. Right? And that's it. So quickly, if you are in crypto, blockchain, Web3 in any way in Ireland, your investor pipeline is going to take you outside of Ireland pretty quickly because you're not going to just target three, you're going to target 100. However, because the ecosystem density here in Ireland and how connected everybody is, these people that you're meeting are great contacts and leverage that network and leverage those relationships you have here locally to get those introductions to investors outside of Ireland where there's going to be a bigger group that will invest in the theme of your business. The basic thing on network, and this is really basic, is you give and you take, right? So we, we make introductions, but also you, 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 you can compound your own network, and it is a great ecosystem in terms of people working together. So if you're asking people for introductions all the time, do think about the introductions you can make for other people. Not, I don't want an intro, I don't need anything back, but pass it on. And Pete's a great, you know, we go back a long time kind of meeting on, on, on that theme, but, you know, I think the compounding of your own network and the presence of a network shows commercial nous as well. So if you, if you have two founders with zero network who could have had a network, it tells something about personality type a little bit in terms of the ability to get out, out in your comfort zone. And you will be really out of your comfort zone if you're a CEO of a company or a CTO of a company or a CEO of a company. So in some ways it also tells to your own ambition for how, you know, how you'll build a business or build a customer base as well. Yeah. Well, guys, I hope that was useful. I think my favorite metaphor was you start on fire and money is the <laughs> thing that puts you out. Um, but it's so a great thing to do as it, well. It's yeah. true as well. So I hope that's helpful for everyone. Um, thank you to our panel. Thank you for coming. Thank you.